That was a one. That was a one-time incident. That was a one-time incident. Yeah, usually it's a dog barking. But anyway, okay. So tonight is our annual members meeting. Um, when, uh, as Jeff LeBaron I would always say, the program is you, and uh, specifically four or five. Anyway, uh, we have a few of you have lined up with uh, short programs to present, um, and. Uh, we're going to kick it off, I guess, with Mr. Joe Stefter. So, Joe, you want to be first first in the batting order? You go. Are you seeing that? Not yet. Okay. I think you have to. You haven't. I think the screen share button hasn't taken yet. So. Right. I don't see the screen share button yet. So oh, down at the bottom of the screen, it's not. Uh... No. Hang on. Let me do this. Okay. Now I got it. Ah, here comes your program. We see it now. Okay, good. Anything? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. A very large scop looking duck. Yeah, it's a greater scop and it's from Forest Park in Springfield. And uh, this bird stuck around for a while and it came pretty close to, you know, any area that you were trying, well, where you were trying to view it from. Um, it's I forget the name of the lake. I think it's um, it's called Fountain Lake. Uh, so it's in the middle of the duck pond and uh, uh, Porter Lake. Uh, and this bird was really cooperative. And I this is just one of many shots. I have a shot of this bird with a mallard, and and it's it's kind of dwarfed by the mallard, which you know, which kind of shocked me. But uh, anyway, this is my greater scop from Forest Park, Springfield. Uh, let's see if I can just do that. Ah, this uh, Janice Zebko will know that th uh, this is from an Allen Bird Club trip in uh, um, Silvio Conti, uh, Fort River Division. And this bird is like, I'm going to say for for the ease of saying it, it's about halfway in. We came up and this, this bird was in front of us and I got a couple shots. And... Um, uh, gray morph, and I mean, I, I already had an eastern screech, but this was only my second one. So I and I and the eastern screech that I had before was only by sound. Uh, you know, it's an unmistakable call, but if you don't have a shot like this, if it's me, I feel cheated. Um, <clears throat> these are black bellied whistling ducks, uh, from the Berkshires. Jonathan Pierce found these. He works for, I think he works for uh, three different uh, jurisdictions out there as a something or other, and he drives around all the time, and he's an immensely good birder. He's he's just tremendous. There were, I think there were 11 of these guys all together, and um, he essentially babysat them for three the three days that they were there and made sure that people got on them and made sure people saw them, and there were at one time, like, oh, a dozen or more birders at any given time, cars parked everywhere along the road where there's no parking. And uh, he was, he's such an enthusiastic birder that I know he made birders, whether it's a good idea to make new birders, I don't know. I'm not going to argue about that, but he definitely made new birders and people would come up and look through people's scopes and see these birds and say, oh, 
<laughs> I know some of those people became birders. Um, Where was that, Joe? Where was it? This was, um, I, I'm trying to think. I think it's like Route 7 uh, that goes down by, um, what's the big farm there in Lee? Uh, Is there, uh, yeah, Lee or was it Sheffield? What are the no? It's not there? Sheffield. Sheffield's in way in way in uh, South County. This is uh, this is basically just outside Lee. Uh, God, I, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, let me see if I have anything here. It's Lennox. This particular section was Lennox, so it's right on the border of Lee and Lennox. There's a road that cuts through, and um, it was like they were just in a cornfield or you know whatever this field is. Uh, and at fir the first people that were getting them, when Jonathan got them, they were way in the back and people were talking about, oh, great scope views, great scope views. When I got there, um, uh, I was like looking way back in the end of the field and I said, Jonathan, where are they? He said, oh, they're right there. <laughs> they were like, I don't know, they were like 100 yards away or something, if, if even, not even 100 yards away. I mean, yes, this is enlarged. Yes, it's cropped. But you can see that this was a pretty close shot. By the way, Josh got me into uh bird observer with this shot and uh, josh thank you right now because <laughs> um you know he he i guess called attention somebody called attention to it josh called attention to it and uh this wound up in bird observer which for me was like really a prize thing to have happen um anyway talking about jonathan pierce he's 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 just an amazing birder who shares his birds he's like really giving guy and you know, he, he's not one to get a bird and then I'm keeping it to myself. Nobody's going to see this bird. I will shut up now. This is from Silvio Conti, Fort uh, River Division. Uh, there was a big lot of bobolinks up there, as there are probably every year. But this is the first decent shot I got of a bobolink, like ever. Because they just, they pop up and they go down. They pop up and they go down and, and you're lucky to, you know, get your camera on them. So, and he's in full tuxedo. Uh, this uh, barn swallow with a bunch of barn swallows up in, uh, where am I? Um, it's Sheep Hill. It's up in Williamstown, uh, Williamstown Rural Lands. And it, this is Sheep's Hill. And this, this bird and the other birds with it were doing the job of barn swallows. That mud that he's in there, he's using to help work on his his nesting uh and i mean it's this is a pretty bird i i just feel like uh i mean i like tree swallows and they're really gorgeous and they really cooperate with you but this to me this bird with all this you know with this buffy stuff going on and that really immensely dark black black blue there uh, it's a nice bird uh these guys are from ashfield uh, the Colt is in the foreground and the adults are in the background. And um, I had a hard time. I got some really nice shots of these birds and I had a hard time deciding which one to show. But I wanted all three birds and I wanted the, you know, I, I definitely wanted the Colt to be there. Um, and these, this, uh, you can see fencing behind these birds, that's a sheep pen. These, <laughs> they were way in the back and then they flew in and I could, I could see them coming in and I said, oh my God, and they landed. I don't think this is 50 feet away. I, I think it's less than that. Uh, let's see. This is a little blue heron that hasn't come into any real blue yet. And this was down at uh, Longmeadow Flats in uh, Longmeadow. Uh, my friend Jean Ju came east to see this bird. And I'm telling you, it was a happy thing that it showed up because I was driving in on, I forget the name of the road, uh, maybe Janice Zepko knows what it is that comes in from the viewing stand. Um, but anyway, it comes in and I, I was driving in and I looked over and saw the bird right by the, it was essentially by the road. And I just stopped, popped out, started shooting. Um, uh, this uh, Savannah uh, Sparrow, uh, I'm fascinated by how closely it matches with these, I guess, the, I'm trying to think if those are nettles or not, or I'm not, somebody that knows plants would know what that is. But I just, um, I'm just trying to figure out how, you know, which came first, the plant and the or the bird um, to get this, this incredible matching. 
uh, Pink Footed Goose uh, up at Paradise Pond in, at Smith College. And I hope you can see the pink feet um, because it's a pink footed goose. Um, and they, oh God, these guys stuck around. There were, it was three birds and they stuck around. Where did they start out? They started out at UMass Campus Pond and they were there for a while. And then they flew up to Franklin County, to Town Beach, uh, Town Beach, I think it's called. Uh, Tri Tri Town Tri Beach. Tri Tri thank you, Tri Town Beach. Uh, they, they hung around there for about a week or more and then they wound up at Smith. So I kept saying, well, they're into higher education. You know, they're gonna start out at UMass and then they're gonna get pick up some courses at Smith's. But these birds were, they stuck around for weeks. I mean, I don't know how many weeks, but more than three. Um, and then, uh, let me I see. I think they put in a, a an appearance at Puffer's Pond also. That one I, I missed. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I'm surprised they weren't at East Meadows. I'm surprised they weren't everywhere. You know, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised more at the places they didn't show up. Uh, this uh, is the Western Cattle Egret, formerly known as a Cattle Egret. And uh, this was at the airport uh, at East Meadows, uh, at the Northampton Airport, basically not in East Meadows so much, but um, uh, to the, I guess it would be the east of East Meadows, the north, kind of the east by north, maybe. And uh, I showed up and uh, I was the only car there at first, and the farmer that owns the property there came out to talk to me, and he said, are you here for the bird? And I said, yeah, how did you know? He's the one who found the bird. He found it uh, one day, and he's a biologist by by uh, training, uh, and he's a farmer now, and he was curious about what the bird was, and he doped out what it was, and he knew that it was a cattle egret. So while we were talking, another car pulled up. And I didn't see who it was or anything like that. And it turned out to be Sarah Griesemer. So I asked the farmer, is it okay if I walk along the airport fence there? And he said, yep, that's fine. You go ahead, right ahead. I'm walking, uh, like really I was walking past where the bird was. And Sarah goes, pss, pss, over here. <laughs> she put me on the bird and it was like, it was like right in front of us. I mean, and then uh, she, I have other pictures of it near a horse that was there as a black horse there. And um, uh you know that um it was just it was just magnificent i've ever since mary mckittrick found one somewhere i think on i think she found one on south maple street and then somebody else found one who, who josh do you know who else got one? Uh oh no josh that i i don't remember off the top of my head i'd have to dig back into you yeah right? somebody else somebody else also got a, a cattle egret uh at a different time in a different place i can't remember who it was now Anyway, I'm just, I'm going to quickly go back to this bird here. Or do I have to do it another way? Let me see. That one. Little blue heron. Cattle egret. Anyway, that's my show. Great. Thank you, Joseph. You know, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful opening act. Um, <laughs> I believe next up uh, in the sequence was Harley Strauss. Harley, you want to take over from here? I'm going to try. Oh, and I, uh, as Harley's getting started up, I'll mention uh, Joseph brought up Bird Observer. If some of you, if anyone out there doesn't know of it, it's a periodical of Birds of New England comes out every other month. And I posted a link in the Zoom chat column to the Bird Observer website. So um, the what what uh, Joseph's referring to, I help compile a feature called Hot Birds uh, that every month features kind of the rarest and most exciting birds from around the state the previous two months. So um, if anyone's interested. So, okay, Harley, take it away. All right, well, my, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. My presentation is going to be outside of Hampshire County, by and large. Um, some of you know that I travel a fair bit, um, maybe four months a year. And um, some of it's for birding, some of it's for other stuff. And so these are some bird photos that I took from basically uh, 
Oh, heck, I gotta figure out how to work it. Um, from um, from Puerto Rico to the Arctic. Um, and I wanted to start in Puerto Rico. That was in uh, February of last year, 2023, um, or this year. Um, and Puerto Rico, you know, is an island. So there's a lot of endemics. Um, and uh, because that's what islands do, they make endemic species. And so um, species you only find there or in neighboring islands like the rest of the Virgin Islands. So there were 19 endemics in Puerto Rico, um, about 347 species overall. And I, I was on a birding trip um, for five days, part of it. And I saw 99 species and 18 of the 19 endemics. And um, so I have a few photos of them here. And um, and um, the, the first, the one on the right is um, the uh, Puerto Rican woodpecker. And um, the, another bird, uh, another endemic pretty much is a plain pigeon. Um, so there, it's, it's a pigeon, I know, but it's really nice bird. Um, and then there are some that aren't endemics, like this American kestrel, but um, which is the most widespread uh, common bird of prey in Puerto Rico. And uh, and then they had a few hummingbirds, not a huge number. A green mango, which is this one, is another endemic for Puerto Rico um, from forests and shade coffee plantations. And this is a, another Puerto Rico only endemic. It's called a spindalis. And the leaves are big. It's kind of a normal, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm not sure how big it is, six, seven inch bird, but the, the leaves there were enormous. Um, and this is a white cheeked pintail, uh, another uh duck uh that is endemic to puerto rico and the virgin islands i believe and this beautiful thing uh, which is uh looks like an oriole is a uh, venezuelan trupial which is um um it's an introduced species uh from venezuela but it, it, it we saw them a few times and they were just gorgeous and this is a pearly-eyed thrasher, which is another endemic from Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And of course, I have many, many more, but I'm not going to. Oh, and the last one I wanted to show you here is a mango, uh, mangrove cuckoo, which we can you can also see in South Florida and a whole bunch of other islands. It is not an endemic. And then I wanted to, from there, I went to the Wakadohatchee wetlands in Delray, Florida. Um, now it's the end of February. And um, so unlike Puerto Rico, which is, didn't really for the size of the island have a lot of species, um, South Florida has a lot of birds and Wakadohatchee wetlands, if you haven't been there, are, is some of the most incredible uh, places. Um, it's a 50 acre property. It was built in, I think, 1996. It's basically a wetland, a constructed wetlands for the wastewater treatment plant for Delray Beach and, um, and maybe Boynton Beach and other places in South Florida. They pour about 2 million gallons of highly treated uh, wastewater a day into it, and the birds just thrive. And so it's uh, got three quarters of a mile of um, a boardwalk. You can sort of see that on the left. And about the first thing you walk in there, if you go in in February, March, sort of the breeding season, the nesting season, the, the season of love of the birds there, um, uh, are these wood storks. I mean, just trees and trees and trees of wood storks. And of course they've got non-bird species there like alligators. But to see things like the Sanhinga in uh, its breeding plumage, they're just 
you know, it's awesome. And, and it's just thick with birds. I, I don't know how to describe it, except for it's a place that one can go back to year after year. Uh, this is a green headed, uh, sorry, uh, gray headed uh, uh, swamp hen, um, which it's kind of new there. It, it's an introduced species from Southern Asia um, and it got established in the 90s there. And they're fairly common, um, but it, and it's you know a big rail that you can find, other than because I usually can't see them. And then the wood storks, you know, they like to groom each other because again, it's um, it's breeding season, and sometimes you get some a glossy ibis, and the light is just striking it, and the colors just shine all over the place. And, and there's another anhinga, which I'm very fond of. And he looks like the happiest anhinga ever because he's about to get lunch or dinner or whatever. And again, it's breeding season. And, you know, we can see great egrets here, but, you know, it, it's really nice to see them nesting and hear that this is mating. And this is what happens after the mating. Um, it's sitting on its nest and maybe you can see uh, the eggs under here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but, um, and and there were a lot of them. I mean, I, I have dozens of pictures of them and there are different birds that are just sitting on their nests looking like that. It's really pretty splendid. And that green coloring around the face is just during mating season. Exactly. This is, you know, full breeding, full mating. It, you, you just don't see that other times a year. And it's just so easy to see. I mean, these are not far from you. These are 20 feet from you on the boardwalk. Um, it, it's just an incredible place. If you can get there, it's worth it. But in February and March is the breeding season. It's much emptier. And I haven't been there at the end of March after all the chicks hatch, but apparently it's really, really loud. And just to think, you think I don't only like warm places, I went to Nebraska in March to uh, see the Sandhill Crane migration and prairie chicken lek. Um, actually, some friends convinced me to go, some Nebraska friends. Uh, and so I've decided the flyover state has something worthwhile to see. And you all know that the Sandhill Crane migration, uh, most, I, I forget what the percentage, maybe 90% of the Sandhill Cranes uh, pass, migrate through the um, Platte River Valley. And this is a picture of the Platte River um, in, well, they, they stay, they, they roost on the Platte River at night. In the daytime, they go off to the cornfields or the other fields to feed and yes, it was snowing. It, there was snow on the ground when I was there. I had to buy a new winter coat actually. It was really much colder than I had anticipated. Um, but there, it was just, you know, it's, there's so many of them more than, you know, these are the same things that Joseph just showed those three cranes that were at, at Arcadia and uh, also out uh, Cummington, I think it is. But the, well, these are different ones, but they're the same sandhill crane species. And right. and this is and, and this is the river. What, what you see above, uh, can you see the pointer? Um, yes, yes, absolutely. That's the those are the sandhill cranes coming yes. in at night to come in to roost. I mean, and this is endless. I mean, this is like 30, 40, 50 minutes, and they're that thick. It's just the most amazing thing. And of course it's gorgeous, right? Even, even if there's snow on the ground. And um, so here's another piece of it. And these are all sandtail cranes. And even this mass thing back here, these are not rocks, these are cranes. Right. Uh, um, and it's, and, and this is a hard picture to take cause it's, you know, it's sunset. They, they come in at sunset. So you need long exposure. So they're not very sharp. But it's really a pretty amazing place. Another thing that's worth doing. And then just to finish enticing me out to Nebraska, they said, okay, not only are we going to let you see the cranes, but we're going to take you to the chicken, to the greater prairie chicken luck. Um, 
And this entails getting up before dawn and going to basically a trailer. And, and it's like 10 degrees out, right? It's freezing. And you're sitting there for about 30 minutes. Uh, well, not 30 minutes, about two to three hours, actually. Um, but for 30 minutes, because you have to get there because you're in a blind. And so you don't want the prairie chickens to know that you're there. And then the males, you know, strut their stuff trying to attract the females. And there's like a couple hours of, of the males doing this. And sometimes there's a little competition among the males. And then, you know, sometimes the females come and sometimes they don't. And this time the females came about right as we were going to leave the trailer, which meant we couldn't leave the trailer. And, uh, and so we ended up staying there for, um, another hour while we were waiting for the females to leave and the lek to break up. So, um, and then there's a Western metal lark that was there as well. Um, I just like this photo. This is actually outside my door here in Leeds. Um, I wanted to talk about Hog Island Audubon Camp a little bit because I've been there for three summers now um and uh that's in bremen maine and uh, i just have a couple of slides this is what the camp looks like um and you get to see you know these cute little puffins um and always it it all, all i think well all the times i've been there it's included a, a trip to eastern egg island um to see the puffins. But this is the one I really wanted to show. Um, th this is Scott Wiesensall. Our, okay, so there, there's Gilliman Appreciation Day in mid-June at, at Hog Island because Sarah Morris, who's over here, that's her thing is guillemots. And so all the faculty uh, dressed up in their guillemot hats and I just wanted to let you know, this is kind of the lead um, for next uh, next month's talk. That's, that's Scott, our world famous author in his Guillemot hat. So, you know, expect a really fun talk. He's, he's really a terrific speaker and one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Um, so continuing on the cold front here, um, in August, I went up to the Arctic, um, to Svalbard, which is basically, uh, it's kind of part of Norway. It's a territory, but it's kind of independent. It's, it's, a, it, the, the jurisdictions piece of it is very odd, but anyway, I, it's about three hour flight North of Oslo. So it's, and, oh, and it's 78 degrees North. So it's way North. Uh, you know, it's your, well, I think, 800 miles from the North Pole. Um, and uh, and then I got on a ship and we cruised the Arctic Ocean to Greenland. Um, and, you know, we see barnacle goose here, but it's really fun to see them where they mate and where in their breeding area. And so they, there's some barnacle geese and um, I have hundreds of pictures of these things, but you can see the goose den the goose down there in the grass. Um, and um, there's a lot of goslings there as well. And again, red-throated loons, we get them here and we can see them, but look how bright red they are. I never see them that red and that close. Um, so the, you, know, you, you just, you see a lot of the same birds as we can see here, but it's a different setting and it's more of their um, natural habitat and and again, an Arctic tern, it's on a nest. They nest straight on the ground. And if you get too close, they dive bomb you, which is what this guy is about to do to me. I'm waving my hat around with one hand and trying to take the photo with the other um, because he's about to hit my head. Um, and then, you know, it's an icy place. And so these black legged kitty wakes, you know, they just sit this is actually a, a, an iceberg almost. And um, northern fulmars are everywhere. 
there, there weren't a lot of birds, by the way. I mean, there it, it's both species poor, and to my surprise, there it was abundant. They, they the birds, other than say the barnacle geese, were not very abundant. I was surprised because I've also been to the Antarctic, and the birds are very abundant down there, and that was just not true of the Arctic. Um, but the northern fulmars, you can really see them. You know, they're the tube-nosed birds that are the open ocean birds and the tube um, allows them to excrete seawater so that they can drink seawater. And you can sort of see that tube up here. Um, I'm done, but if I have another minute, I'll show you a couple other photos. Um, that's the end of my bird photo. I'll just show you. Uh, the Arctic is a pretty cool place. Um, we went around in those zodiacs and that's an eye. Uh, that's uh, actually that's the face of a glacier, and those blues are very true. This is a polar bear. I was actually in a zodiac when I took that photo, um, but we were close. We saw a lot of polar bears. Um, they are still there, and it, while they're probably not that healthy in to Canada, they they look pretty healthy in Greenland and Svalbard, and there were a lot of them. Um, that's a bearded. Uh, bearded seal. Um, the gold rust color is actually iron. It got from getting its face in the sediment when it was going for food. And this is my last one. This is uh, in Greenland on the East Coast in a 400 person um, Inuit village, uh, not Inuit, Greenlandic indigenous village um, that um, that um, it's it's the only center of population in the entire east coast of Greenland, um, and um, and those are Greenlandic dogs, which are purebred dogs. They don't allow other dogs. We saw uh, in Greenland in the entire island, I guess. Um, and he's feeding them raw seal meat that he probably hunted and caught. That's it. Okay, thank you, Harley. Wonderful. Um, I'm noticing a few questions popping up in the chat. Uh, if everyone pl please continue posting questions in the chat as they come to mind. I'm gonna keep going along and letting our presenters do their shows uh, to make sure everyone gets a chance to show their stuff before it gets too late. And then, uh, and then once all of our uh, five, I think, people have uh, shown what they've got, then. Uh, We'll do questions uh, toward the end. So uh, let's see. So is Harley next up, I think, in the order was Steve and Suzanne. Um, so. Hi, um, let me just share our screen. We will be talking about our trip to the Galapagos over the summer. Um, okay. Am I sharing? Not yet. Oh, okay. Oh. Let's see what window. And click here. Oh. I used to know how to do this. Now you're, okay. Now you're starting to share. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So Steve and I were lucky enough to take a trip to the Galapagos and um, spend a day in mainland Quito, Ecuador on the way over the summer. Um, so we spent one night in Hacienda Jimenita, which is a birding lodge outside of Quito. Um, these are some of the birds we saw. We only had enough time to do a two hour guided birding tour, but they do offer like, you know, full day and overnight excursions. Um, on the left, we have a black-tailed train bearer. That's a hummingbird with a long tail. And a white-bellied wood star. Um, and on the right, we have the yellow grosbeak on the top right. And then in the middle, we have the crimson-mantled woodpecker. I think we actually saw more, um, you know, life birds for us on the mainland but we were only there for such a short time. 
And then we took a two hour flight to the Galapagos Islands. If you look over here on the right, we landed in Baltra. That's just where the airport is. And then we took an eight day cruise around. Um, these numbers are the general order that we went in around the islands, but the itinerary kind of took us back and forth to different spots on each island. So that's just a rough idea of it. Um, this picture on the left is, um, you know, part of our trip where our fellow passengers and Steve and I were in, they call them pongas here. It actually looks similar to the Zodiac from Harley's presentation. Um, we took these little boats away from the big boat so that we could get closer and um, sometimes go right up to the islands. This picture is uh, Vicente Roca, which is like at the mouth of the seahorse, if you can kind of see how Isabella Island looks like a seahorse. So it's right in there. Um, we saw nine species of Darwin's finches. We got, or Steve, I should say, Steve took the pictures, got pictures of five of them. Um, on the top left is the woodpecker finch. We learned that it can use tools to get insects out of holes in trees. I think in this picture, it's just using its beak, but that was an interesting fact about that bird. Then on the top right is a vegetarian finch. We saw that one at a tortoise ranch, which was one of our first stops, um, even before we got on the boat, but this was in the Galapagos. Then the bottom right, we have a common cactus finch. And the bottom left is a large ground finch. And then this one in the center, we were not certain what type of finch it was. Now we have the boobies of the Galapagos on the top. We have the red-footed booby. We saw this in um, Genovesa Island, which is a little island kind of up to the northeast of the Galapagos, and it was covered in birds. No people lived there, but we saw red-footed boobies and tons of other birds on Genovesa Island. Um, on the bottom right, we have the blue-footed booby, and on the bottom left, we have the Nazca booby, which they also call the masked booby because of that, um, the black mask around its face. Then another day when we were snorkeling, um, Steve had his GoPro, he was filming this. We didn't notice it until we were watching the footage that he got, but this, um, this kind of streak through the water is a booby diving right where we were all snorkeling. Like you can see someone's feet right there. There's a sea lion there too. But while we were snorkeling, we didn't notice it. It was only after we realized how close it was. And they dive really hard and fast. So it's a little scary. We saw penguins, the Galapagos penguin. Um, is the most northerly occurring penguin in the world because of the cold water brought in by the Humboldt current. So we saw a lot of those sitting on the rocks like this guy on the right. And we also got to snorkel with them and they are pretty fast swimmers, but they didn't, um, they didn't go far. Like we could get fairly close to everything that we saw here. Oops, that was a little fast. And now we have the Galapagos flightless cormorant, which is the only known cormorant that can't fly. They have huge webbed feet and brilliant blue eyes. And we saw several of them standing on the rocks, like this one over here, drying their wings. Um, and you got some marine iguanas on that rock, too. So besides birds, we also did a lot of snorkeling with other animals. One of those was the sharks. Um, we saw several types of sharks. We have the white-tipped reef shark. And so that's me right there. You can um, see how close everything was to us. Um, you know, you can't touch the wildlife, but it doesn't necessarily 
give you space. It's all right there. Um, so we have a sea lion, we have a shark. We actually saw them eating um, like really close to us while we were snorkeling there too. Then on the wait, top right, oh, top left, bottom left and bottom right are all the Galapagos shark. Back to birds, uh, we have the Galapagos hawk. And in this picture on the right, it was investigating the sleeping flightless cormorant. Which, what you don't see in the picture was the cormorant waking up and charging at the hawk, which um, scared the hawk away. We went on a hike to a place where frigate birds were nesting and we could see tons of them puffing their chests out like this. Um, we saw two types of frigate birds, the great frigate bird and the magnificent frigate bird. And we were told that you can identify the great frigate bird with the red eye ring on the female and the green sheen on the feathers while the magnificent frigate bird has purple sheen and a bluish gray eye ring. And next we saw some gulls, some terns and tropic birds. Um, on the top left is a swallowtail gull. They have a cool red eye ring, which you can identify them by. Um, we did all of our adventures during the day but we learned that this is the only fully nocturnal gull and seabird. It eats squid and fish and probably other things at night. Um, on the top right is a lava gull, this dark gray black one. Bottom left is a brown knotty and bottom right is a red-billed tropic bird. We have some endemic subspecies. Our guides actually joked about how if we weren't sure of the full name of an animal or a bird, you can just put Galapagos in front of it and you're probably right. Uh, we have the Galapagos brown pelican sitting here on the rocks. Steve found this Galapagos short-eared owl on Genovesa Island. Then on the bottom left, um, you can actually see if you can find it. We have the yellow crowned night heron. It has um, some pretty good camouflage in that picture. There's also a Galapagos dove, but you can take a look and see if you can see the yellow crowned night heron. Um, over here on the bottom right, we have the Galapagos yellow warbler looking at that spider. Um, so if you maybe noticed it, the yellow crown night heron is in here, but he blends in pretty well. And some other animals, we saw a few reptiles, the Galapagos marine iguana up here, um, Galapagos giant tortoise, and the Galapagos land iguana. We saw some more ocean creatures because we did a lot of snorkeling. Uh, the left, we have the bumphead parrotfish, that kind of funny face over here. On the right, we have a Galapagos reef octopus. Bottom right, we have a sea lion, and I think there's actually a sea turtle back there too. And then another snorkeler. We have a Pacific green sea turtle on the left. Uh, we wanted to show the books that we use just in case anyone is able to make this trip. We have the Birds of the Galapagos by Tui de Roy. It includes all of the Galapagos birds. Um, we included some of the pictures so you can see what kind of detail it gives. And then this book on the right, I believe John Kreicher gave a talk at our bird club meeting in the past. Um, this is not a pocket guide, but the birds of the Galapagos is, but this is an excellent natural history book that includes all the flora and fauna, land and sea, but it is heavy, but worth it. 
Thank you for following our adventure. Um, Steve made documentaries using his GoPro and we have a land and a sea one. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Suzanne and Steve. Beautiful. All um, right. All right. Let's see. So we have one more kind of full length presenter and we also have one uh, one short one to wrap up the show. So, but um, I think our, our next, uh, our fourth presenter is Mark Ketchin. So, um, and Okay. No, Someone's screen um, sharing. I can't tell if it's Mark or if it's Susan. Okay. It looks like it there is. There we go. Okay. Good evening. I'm Mark Ketchin. I live here in Hadley and have been a member of the Hampshire Bird Club since fall of last year. I'm also a member of a very small team of semi-retired physicists and engineers who observe and study wildlife, birds in particular. And we call our project Avian Acts and document of our activities and findings, broadly categorized as phenology, scientific experiments, and education and, and enrichment in our avianacts.com website. And one of our activities involves field trips and from short to long to a variety of destinations where we observe wildlife and take photographs and videos of our subjects, of those subjects that we encounter. And over the past couple of years, we have gone on many field trips to the Northeast coast. Uh, all the way south to the Outer Banks and up to the north to the Quebec's Gas Bay Peninsula, along with numerous places in between in New England, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And all of this is by automobile, so no long distance flights involved. You can, you can get there in your car. Uh, this evening, I will show you a short movie that we put together documenting some of our observations along the coast, and especially from Bonaventure Island, well, which is just off the town of Percy on the Gas Bay Peninsula this past summer. So let me see if I can successfully launch this. Um, just a moment. Um, okay. Everything looks right. Well, I don't have any audio, so uh, I was afraid this might possibly happen. So let me try once again. Um, yeah, remember when you ran the test earlier, Mark? It was you quit, you uh, closed your window, and then opened a new one. Yes, and that's what we are going to to um, what we are going to do here, and hopefully we will be successful. So we will go to um, Mark's. Mark's. I enjoy walking along seacoast beaches here in the northeastern US and watching the birds taking off and landing. All right, Mark, we're getting your audio now. But the uh, the screen isn't being shared yet. Oh, I'm sorry? I, I heard your video. I heard the audio start from your recording, but... Uh, then it leaves running singing. Yeah, okay, I'm trying to... The gulls catch fish or crabs. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, just a moment. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm sorry about this, but hang on. We'll, we will persevere. Um, there we go. 
Um, okay. There you go. Okay. Now we have to see if it still has the sound. Yes. Just a moment. Um, I'm not, let's see. Okay. We have it? I enjoy walking along seacoast beaches here yep. in the northeastern U.S. and watching the birds taking off and landing. Sandalings run in sync with the waves to feed and gulls catch fish or crabs. Other shorebirds have different feeding strategies. Here, dunlins probing beneath shallow waters, and American avocets sweeping the surface with their long curved bills. An American oyster catcher with a small crustacean. These oyster catchers nest right on the sand. Here, a little chick is being guarded by a parent. This is a large flock of noisy black skimmers on the beach. These beautiful birds fly just over the water while using their bills, fashioned to skim the surface, to catch small fish. Truly amazing. Here are two little chicks with parents bringing food. The cute endangered piping plover is well camouflaged on sandy beaches. Here, two males are engaged in a confrontation, followed by a standoff, likely over territory or partner. Another female sits on her ground nest inside a cage provided by local nature lovers. The precocial chicks are fearless and run around free while mother looks on and provides cover from lurking danger. I occasionally get a glimpse of large birds in flight far away from the shore. I can barely identify some as northern gannets by their black wingtips. Many others are too fuzzy. Gannets winter off of the U.S. eastern coast and breed up in Canada. Would I ever be able to get a close look at this beautiful bird in the wild? This summer I drove 800 miles to Percy on the Gaspé Peninsula in Canada to visit a gannet colony. Gannets begin to appear along the shore as I approach my destination. I boarded a boat to Bonaventure Island just off the coast at Piercy. Beyond the iconic Piercy Rock, I watch gray seals sunning. Flocks of other seafaring birds, razorbills, common mures, and black gulamas swam by. Soon the cliffs of Bonaventure Island came into view. Birds were everywhere on the cliffs and ledges and inside large shallow caves, mostly gannets. Over a hundred thousand gannets are reported to be there. From the marina on the west side, I hiked up across the island to reach a plateau area at the top of the cliffs. It was covered with gannets, not the least intimidated by nearby birders. What an incredible sight! 
I could see the striking cobalt blue ring around the eye, the black outlines around the beak, and watch their noisy interactions. Nesting birds had half-grown chicks, not as pretty yet. And juveniles were also mixed in with the flock. This lone gannet is collecting fresh grass. Note the red and silver bands on his legs, presumably part of some scientific study. Fog engulfed the island as I returned to the mainland. Gannets in flight were starting to get distant and fuzzy once again. Okay, so the excursion to Bonaventure Island was certainly a high point of our Gaspé adventure. But there are many other beautiful places to visit and bird in this unspoiled maritime destination. Um, it was pretty amazing that we saw very few other um, US visitors there. And uh, there's a general scarcity of hotels and restaurants, but it's just a very beautiful place. And it's a great, great spot to go on a road trip to both see some wonderful country and also great birding. So thank you for uh, listening to the movie and watching the movie. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. That was that was beautiful. Um, <laughs> let's see, our final uh, and briefest presentation from uh, the editor of our club newsletter, Dave Gross. So, and uh, Dave, do you want to go ahead and share from uh, your location? Sure, I can do that. So you'll just see a black screen. I haven't started yet. I just wanted to set this up. Um, so we've been all over the world. We With Joseph, we started in the valley. We went to various places, mostly in the northern hemisphere. And I wanted to bring you back local, in fact, hyper-local, because I want to show you something that I, I saw just uh, just a couple of days ago when the, when the rain started. Um, it, about 100 feet from where I'm sitting right now, I have a camera on my garage and I, I live across the street from the Quabbin. So we, we get a fair number of different kinds of wildlife through here. And on just before the, the, the big storm started, um, I've got videos of just one species, but I thought you might be interested to see this behavior. So let's see if we can get it started here. Yeah, they're turkeys. And there were some turkeys that, that were going before this thing started. And the turkeys just keep coming. So you notice they're kind of moving in a vector direction. Well, they often do this. And the vector points exactly toward the back um, porch of my next door neighbor, Joe. And Joe puts seed out on his porch. And the turkeys know that. So the turkeys pretty much every day, a bunch of them come through. So I've been, I counted before. I started the video and there were 22 in this particular day, all headed toward Joe's back porch. This happens almost on a daily basis here. So that's it, that's my little show. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, so um, a few people posted questions for various of our speakers. Um, and at least one posted a question that they wanted all of the speakers to uh, 
to answer, I think. But um, I want to start off with mine for uh, Harley, if you're still there. Um, I uh, You mentioned that you'd seen 18 out of 19 endemic species when you were in Puerto Rico. Which one did you miss? Oh, it was one of the hummingbirds. Um, and we tried. We mm -hmm. tried three times. We went hundreds of miles out of the way to try all three times, and we never caught it. Um, which one, I forget. I can look it up, but I don't remember. But it was definitely a hummingbird. Excellent. OK. Um, let's see. Uh, another question uh, that Joseph posted for Harley. Oh. Um, Asking about the noise level when you were there with the sandhill cranes, how loud was it? Loud. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and, and that was with you know a lot of hats around my ears, but uh, it it's a it's a noisy place. But I don't think it's nearly as noisy as a lot, um, sort of South Florida is uh, once the uh, babies hatch. I think that that that's really probably louder. Excellent. Um, by the way, those of you who did present should definitely scroll through the chat and see all of the people raving about how wonderful your shows were. So um, question for Mark from Donnelly Ubertali. Uh, do you need special permissions to visit the, Ga the Gannett colony in the Gas Bay? Uh, interestingly, you don't. Um, there's a uh, small uh, ferry boat that will take you on a little ride around and let you off on the island and then you're on your own. It is a, a Canadian national park. Um, and so there's some nominal fee to get in, which isn't very large. And uh, then you just, you know, you, you go. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and um, the boat ride uh, is also really... <laughs> pretty interesting um, in that you you see a lot of the island as you go around. And the island itself, it, it was only about a mile, uh, a little over a mile to get from the, where the boat lets you off to where you could actually be right adjacent to this Gannett colony where the, we took the pictures. So pretty amazing place. <laughs> Yeah, I actually visited a similar one, but one kind of even further away from here. I went to, when I was a teenager, went to Cape St. Mary's in Newfoundland. Ah. Um, I guess it's been long enough, but I assume the colony is still there. Just a tremendous Gannett colony. Yeah. <laughs> that way. So definitely worth a visit. Just a real Pretty spectacular. spectacular. <laughs> um, all right. There was a, a question that Dave Gross already answered about his top uh, highest number of turkeys he's observed in his neighborhood. Um, answer was 25, apparently. Uh, question, another question for Harley. Um, Suzanne and Steve apparently are planning a trip to Puerto Rico and are wondering what your favorite hotspots in Puerto Rico were. So oh, Harley, you're Harley, you're muted. So you have to unmute yourself to, and then repeat whatever you were just saying. I usually remember that. Um, you know, I can't really answer that because I was in a van with seven other people and the bird guide driver, and we were just all over to his favorite spots, and a lot of them centered around, you know, thirty mile, twenty miles from his house where he knew where the birds were. Um, but I can certainly talk to you offline about um, sort of really nice resorts in some other areas that 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 are nice to go to that also have birds. Awesome. Thank you, Harley. Maybe you could, would you be able to drop your um, email address in the chat bar? Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one last question, um, but sort of directed at, uh, I think, all of our presenters uh, was um, from, I think it's from Bruce Hart, asking uh, if folks can share what equipment they use to get their photos and maybe what it takes to get a, to get the birds in focus for your photos. So let's see, do we want to 
I don't know. Start with uh, Dave. Do you want to be first off and share what how what you used? I guess you already said there was a camera mounted on your garage. Yes, it was a Wise Pro Cam too. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see. Going in reverse order, uh, Mark. What did you use for recording your your uh, videos? Oh, did we lose Mark? Oh no, there he is. Mark, Mark, you are you are now muted. So there we go. Okay, uh, it it was a Nikon uh, uh, point and shoot. Uh, not 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 too elaborate. I'm trying to think of the. Suddenly, I can't remember the name. <laughs> uh, but not a not a real fancy camera. Um, Three inch lens. All righty, let's see. Um, before Mark was uh, Steve and Suzanne, and you guys I know got some underwater photos. So uh, in addition to the oh, ones of the birds above the surface, um, what were you using for your uh, for your photos? Yeah, so for the underwater footage, that was a GoPro Black Eight. And uh, for the land images, that was a uh, Canon SX70HS, which is uh, not an SLR camera that doesn't have uh, interchangeable lenses. It's all, it all in one piece. And, uh, you know, what I like about it is that, uh, you know, it has a very far zoom range and it's pretty, pretty quick to start it up and just kind of and zoom in so it worked that it works out well for us okay thank you uh let's see before that was harley what's your what's your uh, camera of choice harley well um i was lugging around an olympus omd mirrorless camera and generally i had a one 100 to 400 millimeter lens so one of those big long cameras Okay, and all, all the way back to our opening speaker, uh, Mark Sefter, uh, sorry, Joseph. I'm mixing up two of my two of uh, tonight's speakers. Joseph I'm looking Sefter, at, what's, the, uh, what's uh, at the chat. It looks like Eileen Goldstein is who was asking about the equipment. Um, and for my earlier shots, and I, you, you can't know which ones I shot earlier, but I was using a Nikon D3300 with a 200-500 zoom lens. And then for my later shots, I've been using a Nikon D850, which is the last DSLR Nikon's going to make. They're all everything is mirrorless now, so I I didn't want to make the leap to a mirrorless camera, and I I thought this is the last DSLR they're going to make. That's the one I want, and I'm using a prime uh, 500 millimeter uh, lens that has a Fresnel element in it, which is the element that's in um, uh, searchlights and and uh you know lighthouses and so on so it multiplies light in a in a crazy way uh, it's f-r-e-s-n-e-l Fresnel. that's it camera does most of the work it's as far as as far as um focusing goes uh, almost any camera has some means of overriding the if it if you're on automatic focus there's always a means of overriding the automatic focus or you can just focus manually uh, which you have to do a lot when you have a bird that's in a bush or in a tree or something like that. You have to get in there or your camera will say, I want you to, I guess you want to focus on this leaf. No, I don't. I want to focus on that bird. So you, you override it. I guess that, that's kind of it. <laughs> oh, okay, hi. great. Let, well, thank let, you to everyone who shared me. photos and videos tonight. Thank you to everyone in the audience who showed up and enjoyed it. So, and uh, uh, Josh. Yeah, Al? May I just uh, offer a little information? I was a grad student when they first started to work on reintroducing the turkeys back in 1960. And uh, somebody asked about the number that David had shown. Uh, the biggest flock I've ever seen was on Route 47 in North Sunderland, 147 birds. So <laughs> we've come a long way from what we started with back in 1960. Excellent. Hey, Success Josh. Story. Josh. Yeah. This is Mark again. Uh, it's a Coolpix um, P950 that I was using. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Yep. Thank you for checking on that. Yeah. All right. Um, 
I guess we will call it a night. Thanks for coming, everyone. And we'll see you uh, in next year in January for uh, Scott Widensall and Modus Towers. So everyone have fun on the Christmas bird count. Thank you, Josh. My pleasure. That was fun. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Nice job. You're Thanks, very presenters. welcome, everybody. Glad, you had, glad it was okay. fun. Thank you all, presenters. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Derek. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.